Good afternoon, Christopher. Really nice that we finally have a chance to chat again. Um, it, we, yes, we, we, work, we work together, so to speak, on the ecological consciousness page and all that, but, but we hardly ever get to talk, so this is really lovely. And Definitely. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. So Your time now, you're in the morning, right? Nine? Yeah, it's, it's morning here, um, quarter past nine, and it's quarter past five in Japan. And right, that's right. And it was snowing today, but wow. uh, <laughs> it's cold here. Yeah, I, I, I better not say that. I feel like I, it's been cold here too, but cold here means whatever, 10, 12 degrees and sunshine. Um, so it's like, I'm, I'm, well, now it's sunny again, but it's been a, f a few days where the nights have been almost near zero, which for us, Mediterranean types is about the same here. It's about the same here. I'm in southern Japan. I'm I'm right across from uh, Korea, mm -hmm. uh, southwest Japan, near Nagasaki in the south. Yeah, in, and are you in Fukuoka or that's right. It's called yeah. Fukuoka, yeah. and we're we're the closest point to Korea. So uh, this is where actually the Mongolians uh, tried to evade invade here twice. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you know that history about a thousand oh. years ago. I didn't yeah, know. It, and that's where you, you've heard of kama, kamikaze. Yeah, that means divine wind. Mm -hmm. That that actually comes from the Mongolian ships were coming to attack Japan at, here at Fukuoka, and suddenly typhoons came up and destroyed uh, hundreds of uh, Mongolian ships. Wow. And that's where the word kamikaze comes from. Okay. That this divine wind came and knock them out <laughs> I, did, I didn't know that but i have been to fukuoka yep. because that's where i came in oh. um my my wife lived in um, miyazaki for a little bit over a year teaching english oh and, great oh all right yeah that's down south yeah and it's when we when we reconnected like we had been together then then we both sort of ran away from each other i became a scuba diving instructor in, in the caribbean and she taught english in japan and then oh, I started okay. to edge closer, taught diving in Thailand, and eventually decided that, that it was a mistake to have left her. And so I went all the way <laughs> to Japan to get her back. And well, that's funny. And I met my wife here also, <laughs> in the same island, actually, the same island of Kyushu, because your wife was in the south. Lovely. So that's interesting. Wow, great, so, great. I, no, normally with this, with this series, I always like to invite guests for the, the conversation to... Um, to start the story a little bit from their journey into discovering their calling. Like when, when, what were the points in your life um, where you sort of woke up to, hey, this is, this is what I'm here to do. This is what is meaningful mm. to me. This is, this is my path. Okay. Um, gosh. Uh, um, I mean, I guess it would start when I was a, like three years old and I started drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom, my mom is an artist and my, my mom and dad met in art school and my grandmother was an artist and, and I just started drawing at three and I was just encouraged. There were paintings on all the walls. She had, they had friends who were artists. So I've been drawing uh, since I'm three years old and I've always wanted to be an illustrator. And then as I got older, I got interested in it as art. Uh, I started off just wanting to do cartoons and things. I loved Mad Magazine. Do you ever see that? Or <laughs> yeah, the Marvel, Marvel comics and, you know, uh, all, all that stuff. I still watch Marvel movies with my sons. And uh, so I, I started off just wanting to do, illustrate and drawing. And then I got into it more as art. When I, I went to, I majored in art in uh, undergrad. Uh, that's Oneonta uh, University in, um, in New York State. I don't know if you know about the history of New York State. The in, the Iroquois were there originally. It was the Iroquois Nation, and and everything has these uh, Native American names like Oneonta and and uh, Poughkeepsie and Massapequa, et cetera. Anyway, they're not there anymore. They were driven north. The the, the Native Americans yeah. uh, were driven north by the early uh, American uh, colonialists. Sadly, mm -hmm. um, anyway, back to my call. Yeah. So. Uh, I studied art in, in studio art in university. And then I had an opportunity to come to Japan and um, to study here. My friend Annie mentioned that she was coming to study in Fukuoka, where I where actually where I'm teaching now is where I first landed. 
uh, also you landed in Fukuoka. I landed here in 1981, I think, or 82, with my friend Annie. And, uh, and I came here uh, um, wanting to just experience another world and for the arts here. I love the Japanese arts like ukiyo-e and, and things. And um, I was still moving forward with art and I started doing art. And then while I was here, I learned to meditate. And when I first meditated, I, I kind of entered into a stillness that I had never really known before uh, as I started meditating. And that was in my first year here. Though actually the guy who taught me to meditate was from India. He was passing through the city. <laughs> um, anyway, my art transformed when I started meditating. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I, I started drawing these spheres and these pattern shapes and lots of spheres. I don't know why. And uh, well, no, the spheres for me was, I just, I felt there was something, you know, universal about that. The moon, the planet earth, the, you know, all the stars and suns. So the sphere is like this cosmic shape, this, you, you know, and um, so that's what happened. And then as things went forward, I got interested in systems thinking. And that's a whole nother thing. But it started off with the art. And then I got into interested uh, Fritzoff Capra, Tao of Physics. And I know you, you, you know Fritzoff. And um, did I pronounce his name right? Fritzoff. Fritzoff, yeah. So his book, Tao of Physics, and Turning Point, Turning Point, the system yeah. view in the Turning Point, that was influential. Did you, and, did you ever uh, watch the, the Mind Walk um, documentary? Oh, that did? Yes, mm -hmm. Mind Walk, wonderful. Wonderful, Brilliant. love Brilliant. mind walk, yeah. and um, so I and I and I son, somehow the, this this the the art interest and the systems thinking overlap and connect quite a bit, and and that's when you say about like my calling. I guess my the main thing that I've been doing is trying to teach systems thinking in different ways, yeah. uh, so many different ways to teach it but using primarily drawings. So I make my own illustrations, but I also, I also use movies for my classes here. Um, for example, Back to the Future, you know, Back to the Future. That is, it's all about the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. So when I, I have classes, courses here in Japan, we, we, we study Back to the Future, we watch the movie, and they see all these, you know, butterfly effects and, and what happens and Marty needs to set a new butterfly effect in motion. And all the time travel movies are about butterfly effects. And so I use that as an opportunity to teach them systems thinking, you know, and system but, science. But yeah. do, you, do you actually, is your class called something like systems thinking or are you primarily no. you're an English teacher who is doing sort of positively subversive systems teaching in his English. Positively, positively creative. <laughs> uh, because my classes are popular and the, 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 the university has supported me in doing this. Uh, they know what I'm doing. They're, they know I'm teaching movies. I have a class called the English Culture where I can do anything with English. And, and, a lot of, and other teachers use movies. We use TED Talks. Um, so it's, it's totally supported. Um, I've had a couple of classes where maybe I was subversive and taught more than I was expected to. <laughs> um, so, so, so I, I weave it into the cultural stuff and I le uh, and the arts, I use my own drawings. Uh, I've made a lot of drawings about this. Um, oh, I would say, yes, no. Yeah, how, when, when, because I mean, I, as I said earlier, I spent a little bit of time in Japan and um, my wife was teaching English there and I did a few, private English classes and it's not necessarily it's one of those places where people have struggled to learn English and and so if yes. finding people who, who speak English at a high level is is, is not the the norm but why well, it's increasingly getting get, getting there and um, the students you you have are they already at a level that they can actually um, kind of grog the the nuances of what what you're teaching them um, or how how often is is the language a barrier for the content well that i mean that's that's the art of it is mm -hmm. figuring that one out and that and that's why having a movie is great mm -hmm. so for example if we're studying if we're studying back to the future we have we actually have screenplays half japanese and half english 
and we watch the movie with Japanese subtitles. And then the next week, they have to study the English. The next week we come back, they watch the same scene again with English subtitles. So, so and, uh, and then a lot of the content uh, I'll give them. Also, the other thing is I give a lot of visual stuff, so much visual stuff. So the visual is communicating. I mean, that, that's part of my, I guess my greatest interest now is I feel that, I mean, this is something Einstein uh, talked about um, and uh, uh, Richard Feynman talked about. A lot of scientists have talked about imagination, the role of imagination in science. And I believe that basically systems thinking is primarily just using the imagination to represent complex systems. And there's other forms of systems thinking. Uh, I think music is a, a, a different, a completely different language. And mathematics is another language. Okay. But everyone's okay. got imagination. Everyone has their imagination. And with your imagination, you can represent these complex, incredibly complex systems. Even young children mm -hmm. can. Um, so that's how I communicate to them. So when I'm talking, I usually show them something. I don't just talk. If I just talk, they get confused. So I, I'm constantly, I have a big multi-screen behind me and I'm showing pictures and I have videos for them to watch with Japanese subtitles. So that's how I teach. <laughs> I just, just briefly want to pick up on that music thing. That, um, because recently was the, the big anniversary of the Beethoven year um, here in, in, in Europe. And um, right. do you think that Beethoven towards the end of his life when he wrote the last few symphonies was pretty much stone dead? And couldn't, mm. and just like all, all this grandeur of music was uh -huh. playing out entirely in his head. Uh -huh. yes, yes. All those nuances of the different parts, different instruments, um, just dreaming up and then writing it down and, and then having learned over time as he was going deaf, um, to feel it in his body, whether they were yeah. being right, uh, rather than to hear it. It's, it's just stunning to, like I, it's one, one of the things, I, I don't play a musical instrument. It's, it, fe it feels like a part of my, my sort of spectrum of consciousness that is a bit atrophied. And like I, I have, now I have a hang drum, a steel, steel tongue drum that I- well, Hang drum, those are nice. Yeah. I like that. I, I actually was thinking if I was if I was to learn something that was well, maybe you'll have to teach me in the future. I like that. The nice <laughs> thing about these things, they're just it's almost impossible not to make sound that at least you yourself think that's quite pleasing. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> right, 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 right. It it doesn't matter whether a musician would probably say, "Oh God, what's he doing?" But 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 they're so tuned in a way that 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 anybody can basically get into playing a quite pleasing meditative rhythm, and they really take you out. Like I I, I go yeah. on journeys with that. Uh -huh. Oh, wonderful! I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think so. Wow, and that's I, great. And I found <laughs> one. I found one that is tuned in a akabono, which is actually just because you're in Japan. It's a it's a Japanese. Um, tuning that is kind of more like a mole, like a, a sad, damp oh. tune, but okay. it, it's it's beautiful because it it just like um, it sounds slightly different than than um, the Western mm -hmm. tuning. Anyway, th but, but but what you said earlier um, in terms of sequence in your life, so you went to Japan before you then went back to Stanford to um, do your PhD work. Yeah, I was in Japan in 81 for one year as a student. I learned to meditate at that time. My artwork changed. I then felt I kind of found my style, you know, just like the Beatles have a style or, you know, Bob Dylan has a style. I found my style when I was here. And that was, that was wonderful to find my own style. And then I wanted to be an artist. And then I gradu went back and graduated from undergrad in Oneana. And then I found a, a job opportunity to come back and be a teacher like your wife. Mm -hmm. So I was first a university student. So I came back and I, for two years, I was a teacher here. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met my wife in also in uh, Southern Japan, another part, Kumamoto. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I continued with the artwork. And then we decided to get married. I was here for two years, went back to the US and, that, and I had an experience here while I was in Japan that got me interested in education and in, uh, and in systems thinking more. And that kind of moved me towards looking into graduate school for education. And, and this, this experience, I'll give you the short, the short form of it. 
but it was basically, um, you know, I was, I wanted to be an artist. I hoped to be like up there with, with Van Gogh and, and Mo, you know, Monet. I, I, I had uh, over, my ego was too big about <laughs> the quality of my work, but I had these great goals for myself. And then I was in a school in southern, in uh, southern part of the island where I was teaching. I walked in the school and all over the walls was just incredible artwork everywhere. I mean, the whole school was like a museum. I'd never seen anything like this. And I'm walking through the school and I'm there as a teacher, English teacher like your wife, but there's artwork everywhere. I meet the classrooms and I, I, there's artwork on the back of the classrooms. The whole, the whole school is this you know, museum. And I pointed to a picture, who drew this? And a kid raised his hand. And who did this? They were, they were watercolors, another kid. Like every, every child in the class had done a wonderful work of watercolor and they were all different and unique. And I'm like, my brain is like, this is not possible. How can you have, how can you have 35 artists in a room? That doesn't, you know, that's not how art, artists are rare. <laughs> artists are rare. And, and my mind was like spinning. And I asked to see the art teacher and I asked, I, I said, I got to see, who's your art teacher? You know, how, how, what is, how is he doing this? And I met the art teacher and I asked him, you know, artists are rare, right? Right? I mean, how, how can, and he's like, no, anybody can be an artist. I'm like, w w what? I'm like, how? how, how did you teach them? And he said, and he, now this is, my memory is from quite a years back, but this is where my whole interest in education started. He said, well, first they, they have to want to, be an artist they have to have be have motivated and uh a second they have to work really hard they have to build the skills and then last they need a teacher who shows them how to build those skills mm -hmm. and i was like okay they have to be motivated they have to put in effort time practice and have someone who shows them how and then i suddenly flashed on my life and I realized I'm self-taught. I taught myself how to be an artist. I've been drawing since I'm three. I realized that I also learned, my teachers were like Mad Magazine and Marvel Comics. I traced, I used to trace the Mad Magazine comics. Um, I started thinking about what I knew. I knew that Bob Dylan had copied Woody Guthrie's records when he was young and Van Gogh had copied the ukiyo-e paintings and pointillism. Everyone copies at first. The Beatles, the Beatles did all covers at first. So you begin by copying, you're motivated, and then later you find your own style. And suddenly just uh, my whole, everything just, uh, and then I got interested. My, it was like my world turned upside down. I got interested then in education and helping people understand how we all have an incredible untapped potential. Everybody, every human being. This is fascinating because when I, in 2001, started the Masters in Holistic Science at Schumacher College, um, I, I always remember uh, kind of quibically saying to my, my then girlfriend, now wife, um, when I grow up, because one of the reasons why I found out about Schumacher College is because Fritjof talked about it in one of his books. Um, mm -hmm. And it was the only place that at the time he was teaching at. And, and then I, came across it again in reading Joanna Macy's work and and two key influences in, on, on my thinking were sort of bigging up this 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 place in southern England and sudden, suddenly I thought yeah, I need to go there and so I, I said to my wife when I grow up like at, at the time I was already whatever 20, 26 or so, something 27 um, when when I grow up I want to write books like Fritti of Capra um, and and then while I was on that course I did exactly what you just described. Like my method of integrating and synthesizing at the very beginning was literally getting a book. And whenever I, in reading, found one of those phrases or paragraphs that just sort of lit up in my consciousness, a bit like in the Da Vinci Code when he sort of mm -hmm. does the dechiffration of, of codes and the things light up for him. Yeah? In, in a similar way, that, that's what was happening with me in, in, in writing. In reading, I would I would read somebody's book, and there would just be these bits that just sort of sh jumped out of the page, and mm. and I would just literally sit there on the computer and and type those out and create for every book that I read, I created these basically documents 
of, depending on the, the quality of the book, between five and 10 pages of, of quotes that I typed out. Later in my, in my doctorate work, I, I found out that there's something called a C pen where you can actually just draw over the line and it's optical character recognition and, and, and it makes it a bit easier. But it's the same principle of first copying in order to then develop your own style. Uh, right, right. Of it that way. Well, I, and I also kept journals for years mm. and, and also I've, I've wanted, you know, I want to write too and I have a blog and I do writing also and it's the same thing. I would copy other people's writing uh, in journals for years. Uh, just one thing interesting, when mm. I was in graduate school, I had one book that was my Bible because it was, you know, in graduate school it was all uh, at, at Stanford. I was at Stanford and this was my Bible. I have it right here. Uh. Uh, this 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 gave me a framework because I was interested in the spiritual topics and yeah. Zen and Taoism and Buddhism Hinduism. This gave me a framework to put all the science into. So this was really helpful. And uh, I just to show you when you talk about uh, these are like what this is what I would do. I mark mm -hmm. up the sides of pages with my. <laughs> so the whole thing is, and I have all these books that are just you know corners marked up. Uh, and I go back and when I reread it, I'll just go to the parts uh, where I make like some, you know, big wild, like I must have, this page looks like it's, uh, it must have really <laughs> yeah. jumped out of me. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, so same. And, and, and for me too, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer like Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so the same kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah Alan, Watts, Alan Watts' work has been so influential and he's influenced so many other people that then went on yeah. influencing many other people. Uh, I, like, I also really like, like had this period where Alan Watts and, and Gary Snyder and um, mm. different, the early Kerouac books and oh, yeah. um, like uh, Dharma Bums, um, Dharma Bums is a yeah. great book. Uh, <laughs> oh, I read that my, when I was, I read Dharma Bums when I was uh, that first year in Japan. I, my friend Nick, my friend Nicholas uh, introduced me to that. Mm. Yeah, and Kerouac, I mean, I, oh, yeah, great stuff. So, so how, um, your, your other extremely prolific work is, is this, this art of building amazing um, Facebook groups that, that you've curated um, in, in your, core areas i would say like on the one hand there's the the spiritual yeah. tradition of the, the, the Tao and zen and there's the creative right. systems thinking and they're, they're like having four different you know channels to go into there yeah creative systems thinking is the science and and the systems thinking and Tao and zen is all uh, uh spiritual uh hindu upanishads zen buddhism dalai lama Thich Nhat han interbeing and art of learning is with my brother, my brother Jonathan, mm -hmm. and it's all education topics. And then you and I started ecological consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the thing is, they overlap so much. And the way that they've grown, the way that I've, I've helped them all grow, is that I'll share from each each one. I use the others to share them. So when we started ecological consciousness, I was sharing ecological consciousness posts, Dow and Zen audience art of learning, creative systems thinking. Yeah. And they all loved it. And so those audiences built the page. And so the page... No, I, really, I yeah. remember that in the beginning, you amplifying through those pages just, just basically brought a, a, a lot of people very quickly to ecological consciousness. And then it begins to sort of self-propagate because of that. Exactly. Well, it's, I think ecological consciousness was the fastest growing of all of them. Mm. Um, it's grown the fastest. I mean, we're now nearing 400, right? Yeah, I think uh, 400,000. Yeah, we're past 400 now, 410. Well, okay. Yeah. So, uh, oh, by the way, I'm blocked. I've been blocked now since February 5th by Facebook. So I haven't touched any of the pages okay. <laughs> for, for uh, 12 days. Uh -huh. uh, Facebook blocked me. I'm in jail at Facebook. Oh, but, uh, it's, yeah. So because part of, of I remember that, that part of, us starting ecological consciousness was me trying to get my stuff out there and constantly getting blocked. I still have a collection of about 30, right. you're blocked for three days, you're blocked for a week, right. um, bad, right. bad, bad, bad. Yeah. And, right. and then you said you should, we should start our own channel, then they won't block you so much. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. 
it's like I kind of see it as it's like the Matrix, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Neo in the Matrix. Once you know the rules of the Matrix, you can then start to bend those rules and use those rules. But you have to go along with their rules. You can't. You you can. You've got to learn to, to play their rules like a guitar or something. You can't try to to go against their rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the having several pages is like eco ecological thinking. It's an interdependent ecosystem. The the, the four pages work together as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But it, but it, is, a, it, it, it is a fascinating, um, because it's, it's so easy to get into the whole conspiracy thing of saying, oh, they're, they're, Facebook is censoring me personally, they don't like my stuff, and, and they think that shouldn't be out there. And I actually kind of erred more on the side that most of the time it's, it's simply their algorithms picking up a certain pattern that is all about how many retweets, yeah. uh, how, how, how many posts of a certain type pattern right. in what time span and and basically one and and they change constantly so it I, i've i've seen it a little bit as a kind of um chess play between two types of ai artificial intelligence and animate intelligence and and i think animate yeah. intelligence can still win out <laughs> but yeah no i think so well creative intelligence i yeah. mean if you're creative uh and also by the way it's, i find it interesting that you and i have teamed up because you are regenerative cultures and, and understanding reg the regenerative potential of systems. And my focus has been mostly creativity. And then we teamed up and then we, it's, it, I like that we created ecological consciousness because ecosystems and, uh, are creative and regenerative. Mm. Um, it's the yeah. same as we're talking, yeah. At, at, at the core of, I always find it important to point out to people, um, although it, it is actually really obvious in terms of even just the, 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 the language structure, that at the core of being regenerative is the ability to generate, and that is creativity. So, so right. basically, like, like you can't be regenerative if you're not also generative. Um, right. and, and, and so the, the two are absolutely linked. Right, but, and, and they happen at the same time, and, and in, yeah. But, but like, Yes, I, I just remembered there was a question that I didn't ask earlier that I wanted to ask because your, your doctorate at, um, at uh, Stanford was on um, child and adolescent development and education. Right. Tell a little bit more what you were doing research on. That would be really fascinating to learn. Okay, about. well, I, I first, I, I got into Stanford. I found a, a systems theorist there. Mm -hmm. uh, his name's Martin Ford. Um, and uh, he wrote a book called Motivating Humans. And he has something called motivational systems uh, theory. And his father is uh, Donald Ford, who wrote a book, uh, The Living Systems Framework, and uh, Humans as Self-Constructing Living Systems. And so I got into Stanford in part because uh, I was able to connect with, with Ford. And, uh, and I got in, he helped me to get into the department because I had an interest in systems theory. So that was kind of the, the, the way I, I got in. So he was my primary advisor. And so I, I really studied uh, the systems theory framework from him, living systems framework. There's two living systems frameworks. One of them is Miller, George Miller, and the other one is Ford. And, and Ford's builds on Miller. So Miller was first, but uh, Ford, uh, the two Fords, Martin and Donald Ford, developed the living systems framework. So Anyway, I, I, I studied with Martin. He was my primary advisor and just an, a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, I ha I've lost touch. I haven't talked to him in years. I've got to catch up. Maybe if he'll see this interview, I'll <laughs> give me a, a way to get in. I, got, I try to get back in touch with him. But, but I, had, I ended up getting involved with another professor, uh, Henry Levin, Hank Levin, Henry Levin, who had this program for progressive school reform. And we, we ran out of money for, for my fellowship to help fund. I had a fellowship at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved with uh, uh, Dr. Levin in his program, which is progressive school reform. And um, so that was the primary, that was what I, I got in really deeply with. And I brought the systems thinking stuff over to it. Mm -hmm. And it actually was interesting because the, um, Levin is a systems thinker but he actually 
had kind of a, a negative feeling about all the terminology and things of systems theory. He found it, he felt it wasn't, I don't know, he didn't get it. He didn't get it, but he did get it. He got it intuitively. He was a systems thinker and he was developing this wonderful systems program. So I worked with Henry, uh, Hank Lev and I'm still uh, in contact with him. And, and then I worked in the schools with that and, uh, and helping, I like, for example, I spent one year helping a science teacher teach her science classrooms. So I'm back to the assistant to a teacher, which is what I've been doing in Japan, but now it's a science teacher. And, and that was actually the first time I, I taught systems thinking. And the first time I used a drawing, in fact, I have it here. Could I show that? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is, uh, so I'm assisting this teacher. Well, I should first tell the story. The students were studying all the systems of the body, the uh, uh, digestive system and the circulatory system, muscle system, the brain. They were studying plants and photosynthesis and the piston and stamen and just memorizing everything for, for tests. And yeah. it was boring for a lot of the kids. Um, but we were trying to make it interesting. And then they studied about ecosystems and interactions and, uh, and then cells, looking at cells and the parts of cells and the mitochondria. And then I drew this picture near the end of the semester and I brought it into class. So let me, uh, um, th so this is the first time I, I kind of really did it. And I brought this into the classroom uh, and the kids were just like floored. They were, and these are 12, 13 year old seventh graders in a science classroom, uh, predominantly Hispanic, uh, low income, all right? We were trying to help them. And, th and this is everything they'd been studying the whole year and how everything was connected. And they see how the, 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 you know, the energy comes down from the sun, photons are captured through photosynthesis, turned into uh, parts of glucose molecules inside fruits, which are then passed over. The, so we have chemistry and, uh, you know, and uh, plant biology. And then the human, the human being eats, goes through the digestive system, circulatory system, passed through the body, finally down to the cells. And the mitochondria in the cells transform the glucose and oxygen, which we take through our lungs, into CO2, water, and usable energy. And then the energy, the energy goes off into the universe because energy can be neither created or destroyed. So, so it's like this amazing system that connects you to the solar system. And the students saw this and they were just amazed by it. It was like, wow, suddenly everything made sense. And that's really where kind of the first time I had used my artwork uh, to communicate systems thinking. So that, that was kind of a big thing. That was 1993. Wow, yeah, it's yeah. Fasc fascinating to to me that um, oh, let's just uh, unshare so we can see each other be better. Um, yeah. uh, it's fascinating to me that there's a parallel, slightly like different journeys, but s similar stages in the journey. Um, because my like I started off as a biologist, wanting to understand how mm -hmm. life works, and got quite disheartened when I realized, um, like I wanted to be a marine biologist studying whales and dolphins, went to um, Santa Cruz for a while to, mm. to, to work with Bernie LeBeouf on elephant seals and Año Nuevo and um, worked out of Moss Landing on, on um, dolphin follows in Monterey Bay with um, a guy called Dan Costa. And um, realizing that this fascinating what the field of ethology with Conrad Lawrence and those guys in Germany actually started in Germany my, my home country um, the study of animal behavior uh, had become so statistics heavy that mm. you couldn't really tell a story anymore about what you had observed as a naturalist spending maybe like I did three months sitting on an Indian Indian mitten in the middle of a elephant seal harem and watching them during the breeding season and watching them giving birth and the males fighting and all the, mm. the, the drama of, of yeah. what elephant seal life, harem. life. And exactly. Yeah. And there was so much that I learned, but then the amount that I could actually talk about that was statistically significant and had a p-value that was big enough to, so you could mention it in the paper, was, was, was a fraction. It was nothing. It was like the, all the magic was gone by, by then. And, oh, sure. and that's, sure. that's what, what 
gave me a real crisis um, as a scientist because I, for me the, it had been really clear I wanted to be a scientist for a long, long time. And um, and I remember somebody, uh, an, so a physical anthropologist called Adrian Zielman, very fascinating professor at, at UCSC, um, questioned whether I actually wanted to be a scientist. She asked me this question straight out, do you actually want to be a scientist? Eh? Because I was complaining about the shortcomings of reductionist science. And, and it just floored me because I was like, of course, uh, well, maybe that's just a story that I've been telling myself for the last 10 years and maybe I need to revisit it. Eh? And, and, and then, well, long story short, did a few um, detours, but then when I found out about holistic science, um, mm -hmm. Schumacher College, I suddenly thought, oh, I'll go back into this um, mm -hmm. because they were addressing all the shortcomings that, that I'd been concerned, concerned with. But that's, so, so we're going from science to systems thinking, which is what holistic exactly. science was largely about. Exactly. And, and then at Schumacher College, meeting David Orr and John and Nancy Todd, I suddenly clicked on to design right. and and ended up doing a PhD in an art and design school. So we've got the art systems oh, wow. and That's science. Great. And, and also, always, I've, I've said this a couple of times on this, this program, um, I always remember being super excited about the holistic sciences and the new paradigm shift in science and complexity theory and meeting Jim Lovelock and talking Gaia theory, which this image that you just showed is, is, is like Gaia theory and an image to some extent. Um, yeah, that's how we're linked to, yeah, yeah, the planet and human planetary physiology all interlinked. Beautiful, beautiful uh, example of, of, of Gaian cycles. And, and I, think, I think that the thing that's missing, people don't understand, is how art, art and science is totally linked. And that's Einstein talked about this, yeah. and Leonardo da Vinci talked about it. And science is not something separate from art. I mean, you need your imagination and, uh, and, that's what has to be brought into education. You know, that's why I think, I think you and I are, we're scientist educators yeah. and the arts is part of that because in order to it, like, okay, you talk about, we talk about regenerative cultures and how do you transform? How do we help transform the culture of the planet? Because people are so locked into focused so narrowly. They think in political ways, they think in economic ways and they don't see how everything fits together. Um, and if you can show people how everything fits together, you can show 12 year olds and, and change their life. I mean, that's what I try to do when I, when I was university students. And I think that's what you're doing with your work. We're trying to show people how everything fits together, but how do we get a revolution in some sense? How do we, how do we get this kind of way of seeing the world, which I think Einstein, he was a natural systems thinker. Martin Luther King was a systems thinker. Gandhi, most, most highly effective. To be really effective in this world, you have to be a systems thinker, a creative systems thinker, I think. Yeah. No, so how do we get that out into the world is the challenge. I know? think it's, it's arts. Like I did the story I was about to tell was like, why let Schumacher College I had this. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay. No, 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 no. Wait, that's that's a conversation. Like, please keep interrupting. The the um, while I was at Schumacher College, the I'm like you, you're on this master's course, and then um, in parallel at that point, there are other shorter courses that people come up for for three weeks to do, and that's part of the the beauty of the place because you. Yeah, the master students sort of intermingle with the people who are there for three weeks and you get a chance to talk to the teachers that teach these short courses. And there was one guy, um, Arthur Zions, who is um, a major physicist, like important physicist in the physics of light and laser light and, and, and all that at Amherst. And he, but he's also the head of, or was the head of the um, American Anthroposophical Society and had a deep, deep, uh, meditation, like Zen meditator background, and um, in the nineteen was it eighties or early nineteen nineties when when these connections between scientists and the Dalai Lama came up when the Mind Life Institute was was right. founded. Arthur Zions was the first director of the My, uh, Mind Life Institute, and so he was holding these encounters between high Tibetan lamas. And scientists, one, one year it would be neuroscientists, the other year it would be astrophysicists right, right. and so on. And he's one of the most remarkable people I've had opportunity to sp speak with. And I, I always remember that there was this point where 
we were sitting in the in the tea area of Schumacher College and sitting sort of next to each other on a couch and we literally sort of locked into each other into a conversation and then three hours later we were both surprised what have three hours have passed eh? we just went into this space and and in that space he said something that at the time really put me off because I was studying holistic science. I was sort of having all sorts of insights around studying Bohm and complexity theory and, and, and new ways of approaching and understanding wholeness with, with Henry Bortoft and Goethean science. And, and so I, I, I was convinced that this new theory framework of holistic science was what was going to help us out of this dead end of the reductionist cutting yeah. apart story of separation. And, and suddenly this guy says to me, Daniel, the next great revolution in human affairs is not going to come from the sciences. It's going to come from the arts. And, and I was like, what? what, what, what? <laughs> I didn't want to hear it. But, but, but then, because I met John and, uh, uh, and Nancy and, and suddenly got tuned into design, it was mm. years later while I was doing my PhD in design that I thought, ah, that's what Arthur was saying at the time. Of course, design and art is part of the, the same, like I'm in an art and design school now. And, and, um, and even like it, it keeps, I keep coming back to what he said to me back then, and this is almost 20 years ago. And we had a conversation maybe a year and a half, two years ago, where we were sort of playing, thinking out loud, how do we start another summer of love? How do we, how do we right. bring the regenerative revolution into the mainstream into culture and right. and actually it is through the arts the, the whole spectrum of the arts it's it needs to be the poets the the playwrights the right. the, the prose writers the, the 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 musicians um the the fine artists the designers um the dancers yeah. Everybody needs to begin to language this new narrative of our of the story of interbeing in culturally diverse ways. That that uh, that's where we yeah kick so. up the evolution. Yeah, I, I, and, but and also think though that the science and arts are the, it's the arts and the science unified. It's it's mm -hmm. it's bringing them together. Yeah. Um, so it's it's the arts kind of transmitting this. Uh, systems thinking and um, I've had I had uh, this year um, the end of last year and this year I had Japanese students who it's kind of the second time that I got from my students a huge strong um, kind of feedback that they got it they got it with the systems thinking and then my Japanese university students said systems thinking it's systems thinking they honed in on it Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't push systems thinking. We were studying lots of different things, but they gave me the feedback back that they we need systems thinking in school. We should be learning systems thinking. So that's the that's the 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 first time since those uh, junior high students back in the 1990s. So I, I really feel in terms of my my calling, uh, I feel it's art. In fact, the art of systems thinking is kind of title of a book I might write, you know, the art of systems thinking, which is bring it together, bring it together. You gotta, you gotta bring together the art, the art part of it. Um, and, and the art of system thinking has two meanings. One is that, you know, once when you're good at system thinking, you've got the art of it, you understand how to do system thinking. But the other part is just visual, all these, uh, you know, like we picked uh, the uh, Josephine Wall, Josephine Wall, you're familiar. You've you've yeah. seen her picture, right? Could I could I bring yeah, that up? Yeah. Uh, because uh, she, well, actually, you know what? Before I better show this. This next one is my drawing. I'm only going to show this before Josephine because uh, after you see Josephine, this mine, this one, another drawing of mine doesn't look as good. <laughs> but this is uh, this is another drawing that I use uh, uh, systems when I teach system science, mm -hmm. and I just lay out. Uh, all the different systems in the universe and uh, subatomic systems and solar systems, ecosystems, social systems, and then biological systems. And then there's human civilization systems on the, in the right bottom corner. And the message here that I try to communicate with when I teach this in my classes is it's nature and the universe that created most of these systems. 
And then we human beings have come along and we've got a whole bunch of new systems that we've come up with, economic systems, political, education, logic, healthcare, government, uh, technology. But before we ever invented any of that, the universe has evolved systems. And so the universe is a creative system. It creates structures and systems. That's what evolution does. That's what the universe does. Um, I heard the other day you were talking with Jeremy Lent about your daughter, the miracle of your daughter being born. I felt the same when my sons were born, that they're part of this dance of evolution and the cosmos and atoms that were forged in stars a billion years ago or 13 billion years ago. So our bodies, our biology is part of, of the whole universe. The whole universe created us. And this is something Alan Watts would talk about a lot. So, uh, but it, there it is in science. You can teach this in a science class. And then someone might ask the teacher, well, what about God? <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, you ponder that question. <laughs> but here's what science has to say. Uh, you know, some, some people will say there's a creative God. Someone else will say it's a Tao. Someone else will say there was another universe prior to this and we're the child of a previous universe. It's a great mystery. And um, so then let me, let me stop and uh, well, I'll show briefly, Joseph later. Just briefly, briefly before going to the next, the, the human civilizational systems, in my view, are also expressions of that nested living evolving system that is constantly transforming and the interesting sure. bit is be because they're not separate because even our the, right. the most crudest maladaptive life destroying technologies are still part of the biophysical totality that is transforming and and right. therefore they're not separate from nature and, and the interesting bit, and I've, I've seen this now a lot with NGOs, I've seen it with companies, I've seen it with, with movements. The minute you create a system, when that system really, like organizational, comes to life, because it becomes a living entity, it also becomes to have, like, like it has the impulse of autopoiesis. It wants to self-generate itself. Yes. And, and, right. and there's a lot, like what I'm beginning to observe lately in the last couple of, like the last decade, is that there's some really clever organizations that they launch with a sell-by date already fixed. They set themselves up, like for example, the rules was like that. When the rules create, created itself, um, this, these sort of systems, uh, Aikido people that were, were critiquing um, economic growth and other aspects. Joe Brewer was working for them for a while. Um, I don't know if you've come across the rules. Look, look, look it up. It's, it's, they, they've created a lot of really good material. But when they set up, they said, we're going to do this for X number of years, and then we stop. Be because, and there's wisdom in that, because once you create one of these entities, and, they, and it starts to have the autopoetic impulse, then quite a lot of energy gets drawn into maintaining the entity. And if right. the point was the intervention, if the point was the transformative action, the minute you, you've, like you've done that for a bit and then you, too much energy gets drawn into creating, self-creating the old story, like it, to make it yeah. more explicit, like Greenpeace or World Wildlife Fund. When they first yeah. set up, it was a bunch of committed activists trying to make a difference. And as they grew, it became a multinational organization that needs a hell of a lot of money just to maintain its status quo before it can even do any actions in the world. And, and then it actually begins to have the degenerative pattern of saying, oh, that funding is our pie and we don't want it to go to that organization. How do we reposition ourselves so we can draw on that? And then suddenly this, this, this autopoetic energy comes in that, that doesn't actually serve the, the transformative purpose. So, anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, yeah. that's, that's exactly what happens. I mean, that's why also uh, is any like a term like systems thinking, um, I try to be, also be clear with my students that systems thinking is not always good, that Hitler was a systems thinker. And uh, Osama bin Laden was a systems thinker. He figured out the systems of getting into the planes to attack the towers. Uh, he was creative thinker, but he used it in a very negative way. And the same way a, a lot of these systems regenerative, 
it's not only something positive that regenerates, a lot of things that cause a lot of problems regenerate. And once you create any structure, it wants to regenerate, it wants to maintain itself. And then you need money or funding. Um, that, that's part of the nice thing about the Facebook and why, like if, if we discover tomorrow our Facebook pages are gone, uh, it was fun while it lasted. We, we didn't pay a penny. You know, I didn't have to, we didn't have to invest any money. Someone just invested millions of dollars. He lost his Facebook page. I mean, what a, you know, uh, so they, once you try to create something and you then are pouring in your resources, people get invested in it and you lose, you lose a lot of the creativity there. Yeah. No, it, it definitely is. Like I always hold that lightly that, that at some point these, these, um, 410,000 followers on, on ecological systems thinking or the almost 90 or 95 on, on regenerative cultures and, and also re the, the, the group we started, Regenerative Consciousness um, right. Community, has also grown really rapidly to, what are we at now, 20, 25,000 or 27,000, I don't know, I yeah, can't remember. Something. But but it, it could disappear. <laughs> yeah, it, it just could. Like I mean, we'll you're currently room. locked out of that enterprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could, and and that's where the Zen that's where the Zen background, the meditative mind, helps to mm -hmm. to keep yourself, you know, uh, uh, balanced about it. Because uh, everything everything uh, actually that's you know do you know about the Hindu system? Uh, I I teach this with my students. Uh, the oh gosh. Uh, it ties in with this. The, the, can I show the picture? Yeah, sure. Into? I mean, I, I was just thinking. It also, it's it's very similar to like we're we're basically the Tibetan monks with the colorful sand laying out this beautiful mandala on on the floor, only to when it's finished to just swipe it all away again. <laughs> right, right. Well, exactly. Uh, here it is. Hold on a second. I got it. Okay. This is um, trying to get this up here. Sorry, I'm getting my screen share not working um not working uh no uh the i'm trying to do screen share mm -hmm. uh zoom you know zoom can be funny let me try one more time i got it here we go okay so this is this and i put this up on ecological consciousness okay and i thought this is very interesting this is called the i don't know if I pronounce it right the tree murti it's a hindu tree of deities uh the three cosmic forces of creation regeneration and destruction and Brahma represents creation, generative powers, and Vishnu is regeneration, maintaining and healing things. I, I did not make the artwork, okay? I, I made this meme, but the, the actual artist for this in the center, I did the, all the writing, but not the art. Um, and Shiva is destruction. And the Hindus understood that these three forces were all part of the way the universe worked, and they all worked together. And there's creation, regeneration, and then destruction and chaos. And that's how systems work. You have all of these things. And uh, there's not, it's not any one way. And I thought this was, I thought this was really interesting. This, now this was, they saw it in a, uh, had a cosmology for it, but you can look at the universe. The universe definitely has these three parameters or potentials. And, um, and with my students now with this my students i i show them this to uh, the the reason i show them this is to say to them that you're going to find systems thinking everywhere not just in science you'll yeah, find it in and the, because you, art. you you could map that triad onto the adaptive cycle of right of, of, of ecosystems resilience science um because it, it like the, the mention of the word chaos the chaos is one of those words that is really difficult with the English language um, because the popular use of the word chaos is so different from the scientific understanding of what chaos is actually all about. Um, right. And, and it's, it's quite tricky when you have um, a word that brings up such a different mind space in people depending on whether they have the scientific background or not. Most people understand chaos as the complete absence of order, um, but the scientific understanding of chaos is actually the creative phase in which new order can establish itself because old order has sufficiently dissolved to enable the creative right. impulse. Uh -huh. and, and, and as you're saying that, what, what fled into my mind was the 60s. The 60s was a great 
understand, I think this kind of, this understanding blossomed in the 60s. And I think that uh, you look at the, the whole summer of love, the whole, uh, the, I guess it's, I think it probably it's rooted in the psychedelics mm -hmm. because the psychedelics do kind of bring people this unitive way of seeing, seeing how everything's connected and something like the Grateful Dead. The, and in fact, one of, one of the first systems uh, science articles I wrote is called uh, Playing by Nature's Paradigm, uh, System Science and the Grateful Dead. And I wrote that in like 1996, where I showed how the Grateful Dead kind of lived by this understanding of this, this uh, chaos is part of creativity. And there's this dynamic dance and death. Their symbol is death. You know, mm -hmm. they embraced death. They had members of the band die, but they saw death as part of just this yeah. dance. I mean, and, even the uh, title, Grateful Dead, is, is, is really quite deeply spiritually insightful. <laughs> oh, you, very. I mean, Goethe, Goethe said uh, many years ago that, that death is life's genius way to create plenty of life. Um, and, and, yes. you, and you could say that one of the fundamental drivers behind the narrative that created the story of separation and the mess that we're in is a not coming to grips with mortality as a, like our fear of death Yes. Rather than embracing it as the generative force of life, um, right, is they're, they're very closely linked. Once you understand that you can't actually die because you're made out of stardust and and you're right. part of a constantly transforming system that is alive, then exactly. The the sting of death of the individual embodied skin and capsule, brief storyline blip in in time that that is you and me right now right. is is a little less scary. Um, I, much less, I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. We're part of the story of the universe. And that's, the, again, the 60s, this arose in the 60s. We're part of the, the story and the story keeps changing. New actors come on stage. I think Shakespeare talked about that, right? And we're just, we're on the stage now and then our children are the next step and death is part of that. Did you see the film Coco, Disney Coco? No. I highly recommend it because uh, it really shows a lot of a lot of Westerners um, misunderstand what's called ancestor worship. In it, we Westerners call it ancestor worship in Asia, where people pray to their ancestors. It's totally misunderstood. They are not worshiping their ancestors. They are thanking their ancestors. They are rooted in the past and remembering and giving thanks and feeling connected with the past. There's a connection to the past and. Native Americans talked about how crazy these white people from Europeans coming over and they, how could they leave their grandfather's bones behind? What's with them? They don't care about the land. They don't care about their ancestors. So it's a connectiveness, but that movie communicates it nicely. And it's actually based on Mexican culture, but Mexican culture is very similar in this sense to Tibetan and the, all the Asian cultures about remembering ancestors. And also actually, it's, so it's a great movie. And they're skeletons though. Instead of showing the, the ancestors as like these angels, we usually think, you know, Westerners think of angels floating in space, they show them as skeletons. Mm. And, and so it really kind of, you see the death is there, but they don't fear death. They, the death is part of just, that's how, that's how the universe works, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you mentioned the Grateful Dead earlier. The, I think one of the ways that we ended up connecting as we were sort of reading each other's posts and then, then you, <laughs> you responded to my, my lamentations of yet again being in Facebook jail <laughs> um, and saying, I yeah. think I can help. I, I've been there. Um, was, was the, when there's one chapter in my book which is actually the the quote of a Grateful Dead song, "Wake up to find out that you are the eyes of the world." Of the world and, right. and for me, that is, I mean, boom! That's one of those Zen stick moments where you just get the whack right. between the shoulder blades and you go, "Buff!" Ah. Right, yeah. right. That's and, right. We're the eyes of the world, and yeah. and that's why, like, if if any, I have friends who you know are into the Grateful Dead. If they're if they're listening to this, they're going, "Yeah, I know that." I know that, you know, it's like, they've known this stuff, you know, this stuff intuitively. It's part of, it's part of the culture, uh, the interconnect, everything's interconnected. And actually, you know, about creativity, before I got into Facebook, I, I built a YouTube channel where I just made Grateful Dead videos. Mm -hmm. So I, I took Grateful Dead songs and then made music videos for about five, 
five or six years. And, and the channel is quite successful. I don't, I make rarely make vid videos anymore, but it's still a successful channel. And, um, and yeah, well, what's it called? Uh, it's Chase Fukuoka. Mm -hmm. I'm Chase Fukuoka 61. And I stopped making the Grateful Dead videos because I got into Facebook. I got so busy with four Facebook pages, <laughs> but I still have all these videos up there and people still share them. And if you watch them, they're all, uh, they're all the systems, dancing systems. Um, you know what, the, I, sh I should show Josephine yeah. because I just want to, art of this, I want to show, show her because she, Josephine Wall, and there's this other artist who, whose work you like, um, I'm going to bring them both up so we can look at both of them because this is the art of system thinking basically. Let me show actually first before I show Josephine, uh, this is by uh, Sam Brown and this is, uh, I'm sorry, bring this up, this is a painting that I know you also love and this is called Spiral Speak mm -hmm. and this is Sam Brown, he lives in the United States and uh, this is the universe and mm -hmm. the universe generating uh, all the forms and the dance and the mystery and we're part of this this great universe. I I love love this uh, this painting as do you right? I mean you've yeah, you've commented yeah. on this one. It's and uh, and then the second. It's uh, also, it, well, to briefly, what's what's so fascinating is that that image in so many different forms keeps pop up, popping up through the entire history of of art um, and and mm. cultural expression. There, there, yes. was a, there was a Lionel cut on the wall in that room that I, in, 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 the, in the tea area at Schumacher College, where I was yeah. talking to Arthur Zions, that is very similar to that image, not by the same artist, by some student that, that made it. But the, the spiral as, as that, also being educators, for me, the spiral is the best metaphor of learning, that it's, you never complete with any of the sciences yeah. um, and any of the issues. You just revisit them on a, on a different level. And the spiral level. is going up. You're, yeah. you know, the spiral is also is also moving you upward, but you keep revisiting just like the seasons. Yeah, that is, I do think so very much. That's a learning process. It's a spiral. Yeah, the spiral is a universal sign. And actually, the the, the second picture. This is Josephine Wall, uh, and this is also a spiral. And this is called mm -hmm. Nautilus Three. Um, is that one showing? Yeah. Yeah, but it, and there oh, we oh, there oh, we oh, have oh, it again. Yeah. And, and uh, this is uh, this is also one reason I stopped doing art. Um, I mean, I'm doing I'm creative and stuff and doing science, but I see other artists do it better than I could. You know, if if I wanted to make pictures, I'd be making pictures like this. But other artists are, and you can you know, there's a Van Gogh feeling in this, and this is everything. I mean, We're part of everything. I mean, this this particular one is um, you, you'd really need it in a kind of six meter by four meter format up on the wall, mm. really, yes. there is such detail in it. Just if you I look know. at the sort of biodiversity corner to the right of the- I know. Is, is yes. unbelievable who's, who's all there, like all the different animals and- Right. And the, and I mean, sheep I, in the left bottom corner, um, yeah, stunning. Well, and both of these works that we just looked at, I, they should be in the Museum of Modern Art. But there's no, we don't yet have, the art world has not yet kind of seen this type of artwork. It's called visionary artwork, but it's not really yet in museums because they don't, just as people didn't understand Mozart, uh, not Mozart, but uh, Monet and the Impressionists and Van Gogh, people don't yet appreciate what this art is about. But mm -hmm. this is showing, this is science. I mean, this is informed by science. So it's art informed by science. Um, um, it, it also reminds me strongly, and uh, right now I'm completely blanking, unfortunately, on the um, artist behind it. You know that it's been, I actually used it a couple of times early on in in, in my social media work. The, this image where you see that the, the image is sort of too divided. On the left-hand side, there's like falling skyscrapers and a few jets and kind of signs of war and death and, and a destro destroyed world. And on the other side is this this valley that you walk down to a kind of cove beach um, with, with a new settlement yes. li living That's in harmony. Mark, his... Mark Henson, I think. Mark exactly. Henson, he's another, yes, he's, he's another, and he's friends. I know he's, he knows their, yes, Mark Henson's another one. Yeah. And um, I'd be doing stuff work like that if I was still doing art. Uh, but uh, um, 
I mean, that, I just love that. It's just, that's where we are to understand these. I'll, I'll show you, here's one of my, my works, I guess I should show, this is, uh, this, is this I did in 1986. I, I show it now because it fits with uh, kind of this, uh, you'll see it fits with the theme that we're looking at. Uh, this, I drew this in 1986 and uh, you know, <laughs> there it is, the spiral. And um, and I was in I was in Japan at the time, and uh, it's all there. You know, the background is cells, kind of cells uh, of a body growing, like an embryo growing. Top right, and the these organelles are inside the cell. Maybe the top right is sperm. <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, and then flowing down is like water and also muscles in the body. And there's the sphere which is the universal kind of symbol of, of, of the, you know, universal structure. And then the spiral, and then behind them is the, uh, the wall, you know, compartmentalization, dividing everything up. And, and it gets you nowhere. You can kind of tell if you try to walk through that wall, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not really gonna get anywhere. And I, and I drew this all intuitively in 1986. And, and this right after that, I got really into the systems thinking and things, but it was there in the drawing. It just kind of came through. But, the, but with all three of these works, you can see how science, our understanding of nature, our understanding of biology and, and the universe and atoms, all, all the little dots in my drawing is kind of a symbolic of atoms. And, I, and you know. It's fascinating. You just made me remember something that every now and then over the last, by now, what, 30 some years um, has popped back into my awareness, which was that when, it, when I was a little boy of what, I think I must have been around seven or eight, we were living on the outskirts of Munich in a house that had a, had a staircase, wooden staircase, and my mum put up my, my brothers who were actually uh, majored in, in, in art and then kind of left doing art, but he was quite good at it. And, and he had, in art class, he's three and a half years older, he had, he had um, been asked to draw in quite an in interesting exercise for, for kids to do. It, it was three pictures of the same little ridge that the observer was sitting on, so to speak, looking down into a valley with some mountains in the background in a river. And the first picture was sort of uh, quite lush, a, a growing human settlement in the center. The middle picture was a sort of dystopic techno future of almost all green, gone, everything quite um, urbanized and, and concrete, steel and glass kind of, but, but already with the signs of pollution and, and everything. And, and then, no, it was actually four pictures. And then, and then there was one that it was complete dystopia, all of that um, broken down. And the fourth one was nature coming back in and, and basically regrowing the place. It was green again. And it was these mm. four images and they were really quite detailed. My brother drew them. And I, 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 I keep hoping that one day I'll look through an old box in the, in the cellar of my mum and find these pictures because they're, they're etched into my mind. And, and to some extent, they're quite prophetic. <laughs> and like they're, and they're, they really touch me in, in a deeper yeah. way. Yeah. And it's also interesting how when you see something, you remember it like that. Something like mm -hmm. that, that just, that, that, you know, for example, the drawings, the drawings I showed today, a lot of those, they stay with people. Because once you see it, your brain keeps a, a representation. That's where the imagination, for me, imagination, uh, I, I would call visual intelligence. Mm -hmm. And everyone talks about emotional intelligence and social intelligence. And in school, we focus on language intelligence and mathematical. But your imagination is visual intelligence, and it represents the universe. And that's how we do a lot of systems thinking. So when you see something, it's, it can stay with you. You don't forget it. You may forget the names of the different parts of the body mm -hmm. or of, of a plant or a bo human body, but you remember the connections. The brain has the ability to hold that. 
So how do we get education? You know, here's the big question because we're nearing, you've got to go soon, right? But we, we, before we um, started, we talked about, okay, so how do we help change the world? How do we get these ideas out and help kind of the young, in my opinion, the answer is with young people. And the answer is education. How do you get this into schools where children are merging, where teachers are using art and science together and mathematics and showing how everything's unified and presenting students with this? You know, how do we do that? We figured that out. A lot of, there are so many different, we meaning educators, my field education figured all this stuff out. Maria Montessori was one of the first and then you've got the Waldorf schools was another approach. John Dewey had an approach. There've been many different approaches. And in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, in my field education, there were programs all over the United States of learner-centered, creative, integrating the curriculum uh, in, in fascinating, wonderful ways, but it was all shut down after we hit the, um, 2000, 2001 with the, um, the start of the, the, you know, the World Trade Center. And the, after that, they came in with uh, high stakes testing. They started emphasizing testing and measurement again. And they crushed incredible innovation that was happening all over the United States. I have a video, would be right if I show yeah. this, because people, yeah, people should lovely. know that, you know, people would be like listening like, yeah, well, how do we do this? It's like, what's well, been done? It's been done. You just have to let me show you. This is um, this is Deborah Meir. Deborah Meir is one of the um, educators who had a project. I was with Hank Levin. He had a project at Harvard. There was uh, Howard Gardner had a project using his ideas about multiple intelligences, and uh, at uh, James Comer at Yale University had a project. There were projects all over Europe, and um, Finland has been doing things. But all of these projects were crushed. But let me just show what it looks like. Yeah. So this is this is a uh, this is just a minute and a half of what would what could education look like, and, and it does actually in certain places it looks like this. So this is Mission Hill. This is Deborah Mears' project. I'll just show a little yeah. bit. One of the most important things is creating a climate of trust. And we had to work really hard at that. I wish you had questions, comments, and concerns. She's not engaged to the level that I would like her to be. So that's really my question. There aren't a lot of places that are staff run and you get to have the same kind of same voice in what you do. Real freedom and autonomy to work in our classroom. You just have to know them. You have to know what they like to eat. You have to know what they're favorite thing to draw is you have to know them to teach them well. Do you have any advice for other kids who are trying to work things out with somebody yes. they don't like? You could try and play with... Uh, uh, is there a difference between smart and wise? A little bit. What's the difference? Where does the difference rest? It's chemistry. It's math. It's literacy. It's all of those things for the bakery. It's all this interconnectedness that makes this real for children. If we want children to be inventors, we have to give them opportunities to invent. If we want them to be problem solvers, we give them moments of independence to figure out things for themselves. Okay, so that's uh, Mission Hill, Mission Hill School. Good wow. morning, Mission Hill's name of the video. They have, they have a whole series of videos showing how they implemented this, this approach, this, this paradigm, this model, how they implement this model. It's a learner-centered community building, focusing on multiple intelligences, social intelligence and art, visual intelligence and language and mathematics, everything's interconnected. And they're not the only school. We were doing the same thing, uh, the project I was in. And any, any school can do it. The teachers, you have to, first of all, you have to give up control outside. No one outside the school should be determining what's going on. It's the teachers working with the children, working with each other, working with the parents. They make a community. So you're regenerating community. Your school is a community. Absolutely. And 
And now with COVID, everything's in chaos and everything's fractured. But when we get past that, and we will, COVID will be gone at some point, and we can get people back where you can actually, you know, touch somebody and, you know, hug someone or get close. We, ha we have the model is out there and, and um, it's been developed all over the world, but, but the, you know, people in positions of power um, have to be aware of this because they're the ones who sometimes crush, crush these incredible innovations. I mean, there, there's yeah. so much going on. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's probably quite traumatic for a lot of um, kids in school to have to go through schooling in a, pandemic but but i i've observed that precisely because, like for example there's a there's a massive um rush into forest kindergarten and forest school type projects because um people don't want their kids to sit with a mask in a classroom yeah. um, in some countries like my i have a good, very good childhood friend who was a teacher in germany and and he's standing like with scarf and coat and they're all dressed as if they're going for going skiing and they're sitting in their classrooms with their mask with the window open in order to ventilate minus three outside and he's trying to go through the material that he normally covers and it's textbook. Both, go through the yeah, textbook. both for the yeah. teacher and the students it must just be a nightmare but but there's a lot of places like here here on, on Mallorca there are a lot of um, new forest schools setting up and also more parents that like I think it, it will possibly, in, in Spain, for example, um, homeschooling is not allowed. There are, there are no pathways that you could create a homeschooling group and take your kids out of school, and at least for, for primary school. Um, wow. one, once they hit six, they have to be in school. Um, and like basically the, the police could come and arrest the parents or find the parents if they're not. Um, mm. And so this, these kind of things are beginning to break down now because of the, the COVID response. Like people, people are saying, look, I, if you're forcing me to homeschool, then let me at least come up with a way that, that I can do it um, more creatively in, in community. Right. And, and also like, the, the, because you mentioned Fritjof Capra earlier, the work that he did through the Center for Ecoliteracy in Berkeley, um, like bringing the teaching of fundamental literacy and ecological systems thinking into the, the K1 1 to 12 curriculum uh, um, it, and, and in, in working with schools all around initially the Bay Area and, and, and actually in the entire California school system to, to yeah. offer the, these new methodologies. And another, another initiative that comes to mind also in California, that I, I'm on the advisory council of the Ojai Foundation that, that has brought the ancient um, sacred technology of council into a Western world context. And, and what, what they've done is they worked with the LA school district, bringing the practice of council to some of the worst, most complicated schools in kind of Compton and like the parts of LA that are sort of close to no-go areas. And the minute you bring counsel into the classroom, bullying just drops. Right. Because people like listening from the heart and speaking right. from the heart in a circle, right. people right. begin to appreciate that the nerdy bullied kid actually has a depth of wisdom that right. that that is to be aspired towards. And 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 right. people can hear each other's pains and and um and 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 dreams in a different way right no there's and, and there's so many different ways this can be done and everything can be integrated together and uh but you have to free people up locally to regenerate community they have to you have to create community every classroom is a community every whole school can be a community and that regenerating of community is one of those like natural systems in in the universe a social system that, and that's what we've lost, I think, in a lot of places. That's, that was the attraction of the Grateful Dead in the 60s. You mm -hmm. had the sense of a whole community. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think that, that there's a, a lot of opportunity. And I think we have no choice because, our, and this is what my students, my students here in Japan tell me, um, they're, they're very aware of the ecological crisis ahead and that we've got to absolutely recreate, redesign, transform all the systems, not just uh, 
you know, environmental issues, but social issues and politics, everything, council, politics should be having, the, you know, local council locally. And we have to do this if we don't, our children, my, my sons are 25 and 20, your daughter will be three, she's two and a half. Four, maybe four. Yeah. Four, okay, oh, wow. So their future, you know, the, the indigenous people understood this, you always think ahead seven generations. Mm -hmm. And our modern, I don't know what's up with civilized people. We don't think ahead even uh, 20 years. And we have to because this planet's gonna become like mad, the movie Mad Max. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a horrible, horrible world if we don't transform everything. Um, but I, I, what I find is that with my students that balance, let them know the prob potential problems up the road, but also get them in touch with their creativity, how to work with people, systems thinking, and then they get excited. It's like, all right, let's build a new kind of, you know, redesigned civilization. You know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fine art to, to speak about that the dysfunctionality of the current trajectory and the potential of, of extinction, like Extinction Rebellion, tried to, to rattle the world up towards finally recognizing. But there's also an element of the inevitability of collapse, but not creative collapse in the sense we were speaking earlier of, of breakdown of structures that no longer serve in order to then actually un enable the new burst of life to come forth. Yeah? Right. Or to like, there's too many voices now that 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 to my mind, that that a sort of doom. This is already too late, and we might as well, and and so on. And and it 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 it's sometimes kind of a bit of a demagoguery to to rest in that. People go there because it gives them a lot of attention when they're the voice of the. It's inevitable to um, to, for all of this to to go down the drain. And, and I, I find it's really important to show the po possibility in the sense of, because th that opens up the whole confrontation of death and death and rebirth and, and the, it being part of life that things dissolve. But also it, it brings this, what, what I love so much about this, the impossible future video that my friend Martin Haas created on, on the basis of that wonderful Joanna Macy poem, Dear Dark, uh, well, actually, Rainer Maria Rilke poem um, that Joanna Macy translated, The Dear Darkening Ground. When, when he, at the end of this poem, um, he speaks to this, this moment of inexplicable terror when you take back your name from all things and become water and widening wilderness again. Um, but then he also says, give me a little more time, give me just a little more time so I may love the things until they're real and ripe and worthy of you. And I think we need to bring kids into that space of saying, we can turn this around and we can create a different future, but even if we don't, we need to celebrate the moment of what is right now. Enjoy the creative activity that you have in this moment. Yeah? That that's for me. That that's I was my you know sometimes someone's talking and you're thinking <laughs> you want to say something. You just said what I wanted to say. Yeah. That it that's the focus, yeah. uh, not the future, right now. And and in 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 Buddhism, this is called a jhana. Jhana. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Is stages of enlightenment. And one of them is to no longer think about what ought to be, but to focus on what is. You focus on what is, what is now, and that's the mindfulness and the interbeing. And when you see all this potential that every human being has, and all the potential these children have, and how beautiful our planet is, and we just start to love, love and nurture what is here now, then the future is born out of that, and you and I can't design it. There's no design. We don't have a design. It's the kids who have the design, and they got to be loved to bring out the design. So we can't even tell them what the path is. They'll, they'll build the path and they'll design it themselves. But you have to see the potential in, those, in the youth and, and in, in people that anyone who's kind of feels kicked to the side of the road. Um, I mean, for me, I, I sometimes think about the street children. There's, there's like, I think like 100 million street children in the world. I mean, we've got Mozarts there and Einsteins and future, I mean, just geniuses and and incredible talent in all these impoverished children and their families are destroyed, help them. You know, no one is helping them. 
all the poor in the world, all the poor people. And that's why this education model that, that I, I showed you, this can be done with poor communities and the community can create their own version. So Native Americans, Latin Americans, Asian, you know, whatever community, you make what you design it your way, but you can create what fits your ecosystem, your human ecosystem. And, and then out of that will come this genius. There's this genius, uh, there's this idea of collective genius. And, um, and that's the future. And, and, and uh, that's why I, I'm excited, but you gotta help people see that potential right here, right now. Yeah, I mean, three, three things that are sort of loose ends of this wonderful conversation that I wanna, wanna pick up on before we, before we end. Um, one, and, and they all fractals that we could spend another 90 minutes talking about. Right. <laughs> um, I, I, one thing that I was, when we made the first one to pick up on you, you saying that the, the power of bringing kids, teachers, and parents together to create community. Um, it made me think of, again, Fritjof Kapra, there, there, there's this, in this series, there's a conversation I had with Fritjof Kapra at the beginning of um, 2020, I think, before the, 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 yeah, it was January 2020, um, before the lockdowns and everything, um, where, Fritjof and I kind of converge on that really life is a regenerative community and it's a nested regenerative community that life generates life through forming communities. Did we come up with that in a conversation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we, we, we did in about two years earlier. Um, you, you mentioned that to me, life as regenerative community. Right, and, right. And, and But then um, Fritjof, like it's... It, Again, these these things aren't anyone's idea. They're kind of expressions. Right, it just and yeah. but, but I found it just really um, encouraging to have an old friend and mentor of mine like Fritjof to to sort of synthesize his bril brilliant work in, in um, the systems view of life um, as well. Life builds life through regenerative community. Um, right. Right. That, that that's one piece that I just wanted to sort of tie together. The the other bit is. And this this is a real, um, literally a rabbit hole in a kind of Alice in Wonderland type of way. Um, what you mentioned earlier, with, with when we're talking about the Grateful Dead and the '60s, and um, there is a taboo in our culture around um, plants of the sacred, the the psychotropic substances, right. psychoactive right. substances that that disrupt the way that entrained by education and somewhat indoctrinated or cultural osmosis, the repeating of old patterns that actually no longer serve, that hold us in mental spaces that literally make us see the world in accordance to these frameworks that we sometimes not even conscious of because they've, they've, they've just come in through our culture and through our education subconsciously. Um, what all these sacred medicines do is that they, for a moment, disrupt the autopoetic pattern of these frames and let you see without those frames. You, you right. suddenly see different patterns emerge. Right. You, you see the interconnectedness and you see, um, like you experience interbeing and you right. experience the creative power of mind as a participatory agent in reality right. and and all cultures have been careful about them none of none of them kind of did it lightly oh, let's go to a party and pop one of those that's that's an immature use of these substances but in use the, the use in ceremony as rite yeah. of passage as guidance has been probably with us, possibly, I mean, when, when you speak to it, like my, my friend Paul Stamets and I had long conversations around this, it's, it's entirely possible that the, the rapid evolution of the human frontal lobe was actually made possible by those substances. It's like the, 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 the ingestion of um, psychedelic fungi um, psilocybins might, might yeah. well have in, helped to create this evolutionary divergence from right. the, pri right. the primates towards the, the, the hominids. And um, so I, I, I feel we need to, but it's, it's a very careful thing to 
right. like box to open. It's not a kind of free for all. Let's just all pop as many drugs as possible. It's a it's a real recognition that maybe in a sacred ceremonial use of these substances can help us break free of the prisms we've built over centuries of education as indoctrination and and can help us find a different path i i agree with you but i also think there's many paths yeah. and so that that's and, and so i i respect that path because uh you know alan watts is is someone I look up to. I know Fr with Fritjof, it was part of his path. I, I, I respect that path, but I think that art can do the same thing. Yep. And the, art, the arts can transform. And that's, that's, I wrote a blog on that, how the arts transform consciousness. But I think art, the arts have poetry, the poetry of William Blake and the poetry <laughs> of uh, the transcendentalists and mm -hmm. the artwork that we just looked at, the, sp the different spiral artwork the, the, that's what Van Gogh was screaming to us. That's why people, but I think, here's the thing. I think it's amazing that people have this intuitive wisdom. So why, why is Van Gogh respected and loved in the whole world? Because people get a sense of the message from him. Alan Watts is gone, but if you go to YouTube, there's, there's so many YouTubers who put up his videos because he speaks to us. There's wisdom that comes through words. With Alan Watts, he uses words. Uh, with artists that you can use art that's another path and but everything is about reconnecting because we have we live in this compartmentalized culture where we've just divided everything into boxes and we don't see the interconnections and that's what my students told me my students said the you know the the systems thinking was amazing and just seeing how everything is connected and uh, some people don't like that everything is connected everything is connected doesn't mean that I'm connected to everything, but it means that there's these networks mm -hmm. that connect us. And that is a fact that there's these network, these webs of a web of life. Everything is connected together as that drawing showed of our bodies. We're connected to the sun. We are linked through a transport system to the sun, to the earth. Our DNA is connected back through history. Um, yeah. So, so I agree with you, but it, but I think that arts can communicate that message too and help people reorganize. I mean, one thing with psychedelics, people have, many people say afterwards, they still remember the insights and the insights stay with you. And I believe that that's a reorganization of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that reorganization of consciousness can happen with, with artwork, with a drawing too, yeah. uh, with a song, you know, a story, watching a movie, you know. No, I, I, the last thing I, I wanted to share, which relates to that, is um, is is this. I'll, I'll share an image too. Um, the the story behind that image. I don't think I've ever shared. This. That's the cover. The cover of your book, right? Yeah, that's the cover yeah. of my book. And and one of the reasons, like at some point in 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 doing a course in facilitation many years ago, I I was told that. PowerPoint slides and the kind of um, dead typeface of, of printed slides um, doesn't give the same learning effect as actually hand-drawn um, images on a flip chart. Basically, the minute it's, it's drawn, it, it comes in differently. So the, all the illustrations in my book, I've uh, worked with an artist here on, in, in Mallorca, yeah. Illustrator, um, are redrawings of scientific graphs in a more artistic way because it, it, it right. lands differently. And then, then we had this, this what, what's going to be on the cover? And initially for a long time, I, I had this image um, of a vortex that, that I wanted on the cover, but then I couldn't get the permission to use it. And luckily I didn't. And so I was, I was then sort of playing around. This image has so many layers of meaning. It, it, right. it it is the sacred wheel of the four directions. It's north, right. east, south, and west. It's the Ind Indian wisdom, uh, the Native American wisdom wheel. Um, it's the four elements, water, right. air, um, earth, and, and, and fire. Um, right. it's, it's the infinity Möbius loop, but it's also the um, adaptive cycle of, of resilience, the, 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 the image in the center. Right. Um, right. It, it's the four quadrants of integral theory but by putting that image in the middle it's 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 my critique on integral that they're just they have a categorizing approach to consciousness they just put mm, things into boxes yes. and very yes. often 
forget the connection between the boxes. Yes, I, I, I felt that too. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, the, just to, to bring it all to, back to where we started when we were talking about Japan, um, there's a beautiful story behind how this came to, to be. Like uh, we were sitting in, in Flavia Gagulio's office, the illustrator, and I said, I want, I want the four elements in there, but I don't want it to be kind of flimsical, um, like sort of images of a fire, images of water, like photos or something. And then I said to her, well, let's, let's bring up the great wave Hokusai, um, the, the, the painting. And then, then I said, ah, oh, let's just search for Hokusai paintings and see whether we can draw out of Hokusai paintings the um, like yeah, little, yeah. little corners that, that, um, that represent the four elements. And so right. we quickly found an, an image with the clouds, the, the one in the top left corner. And right. I didn't, initially I said, let's not use the great wave. Everybody knows the great wave. Um, so we found another painting where he's got these amazing fractal cosmic uh, chaos paintings of water, the, the one in the bottom left. The, um, then Earth was a bit more difficult because we found this bit of this Earth image but that's altered like all the see that the suddenly i thought i do want to have some human beings in this story and and we didn't have any and and then i also noticed that the picture we chosen for for the earth element had a bit of tilled ground in it and you can't write a book on regenerative cultures talking about regenerative agriculture and, it, and then have a picture of tilled ground on the cover um, right, right. which is a big no-no in, in in regenerative agriculture so i asked i asked flavia to to draw into that space into the hokusai painting the the garden and the two small figures in the bottom left uh, right, the bottom right. right corner and then and then what's what for me is the most magical part of this image is that we spent another half hour looking at images, hokusai and fire. And the only thing we could find was like a bunch of samurais sitting around a smoldering campfire that wasn't really dramatic. And then suddenly I had this idea and I said, actually bring up the great wave, turn it by 90 degrees, change the color from blue to red colors. Mm. And that fire, is Hokusai's mm. great wave turned upside down and color altered? It, it, it's wow. it, it's not fire; it's water. Um, yeah, yeah. And and that and and that moment, I suddenly thought, wow, this is really powerful. We're just doing an alchemical transformation of elements here, and we're weaving it into this multi-dimensional image that communicates pretty much in one image what this book is all about. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, I just just felt like it, it was oh, great. Great, great. Uh, one thing, my son is uh, my son Andrew uh, is doing photography. He started recently, and he took some flame photos, mm -hmm. and uh, they're just so beautiful. And there, there is something water-like, or even tree-like, like a a Van Gogh tree with the with the flames. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and and that's uh, that's uh, the uh, what you call it, in the Trinity, the the mm -hmm. Hindu Trinity, the power of the destruction, right? The flame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there it is. It's part of everything. It's part of everything. Part of the 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 the, pa the way you, the universe works. Amazing. Yeah. Beautiful image. I love that. I love how. And that's the kind of thing to get everyone to think about this. You know, if we can, um, I think we'll we'll be successful to uh, deal with the coming collapse. There's going to be some kind of collapse. Yeah. Uh, but, there, yeah. But, but there's always been. I mean, that's the the, the reframe right. that I like so much about. The work right. that, that Robert Gilman has done is that that he, one at the same time he he, like in this framing of a 250 300 year transition period between the end of the age of empires or the era of empires, the power over that started with agriculture and city states and then nation states and empires, that took us all the way into the the war between religions when after the reformation and and that then kick-started the scientific revolution and and the renaissance um and he basically puts the beginning of the planetary era at the renaissance which is also still the beginning of 
the power over science and technology that made actually the era of empires even more drastic and in, in their expression and created the two world wars and all that. But, 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 but he basically said the era of empire started collapsing at the beginning of the Renaissance. And, and we are just, from our pers human perspective, have too short lifespans to see that we've, we've been living in collapse of, for, for many generations. Um, of a system that that no longer fitted life's way of creating condition, con conditions conducive to life, and the same sciences that were co-opted by Horizon One, the prevalent system to be power over and power of destruction, can also open up the window into this m magical, yeah. mystical universe again, like the the work that Thomas Berry and Brian Swim try, try, oh, try to yeah, bring into the world. Of, of re-enchanting the world through scientific insights, retelling a, a spiritual story using that. I think that, that's where, so we're, we're, in, we're in collapse, but at the same time, we're in the emergence of a whole new era of, of humanity. But of course, the, the, the jury is out whether we disrupt the climate system of the planet to the point that we're kind of, just when we get it, we realize well, that we're faced with it. We're faced with a collective crisis for everyone, a global, a global crisis. I would think one thing about the historical, though, I think there is a huge problem with the Eurocentrism and the Westernness of history as it's often presented, because mm -hmm. I would say that we became a global situ uh, civilization when the peoples from Asia went and moved into what we now call the Americas. And as they moved down and, dis and explored and discovered all the different areas, uh, that's when we became global. And I, I sometimes have in my mind, there was probably a time 5,000, 6,000 years ago, uh, 7,000, I don't know exactly the time, when you had humans all over the world in, 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 in all different corners, you had people, the uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, they were there for even more than 10,000 years ago. And That's everyone's amazing. sitting around fires. Everyone is doing drums. Drums drums, and the bow and arrow and the knife were the first technologies. The, the, the bow and arrow and drums traveled out from Africa. And they were all over the world. People were drumming around fires. And if you could see this from space 10,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, you see these little fires all over the world. And we were all living in an indigenous way. We had indigenous style cultures, all of us, before this empire uh, thing started with the civilizations. And, and history needs to be kind of, you know, we need to step back a bit and look at, at, at these two mm -hmm. kind of cultures because the indigenous culture was very community oriented very regenerative of, of relationships social emotional intelligence family love and relationship with the ecosystem direct you want food you just take it from a tree or you go out respecting a deer kill it and say thank you i mean this is this is why the movie avatar was so popular mm -hmm. because people have a, a sense of that it's in all of us that was the old culture for everybody so um I think we were a planetary species a long time ago, yeah. and the and there's a lot of explorers who were not acknowledged as the first discoverers and explorers. Yeah, absolutely. When go, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When I go home to New York, uh, the names of everything they're all Native American names, Iroquois, and they're all gone. They were all kicked out, and um, you know I'm aware of that. Living in Japan, I go back. I go back to the U.S. and I feel like a, I feel like an outsider a bit, and I can I see it in a different way. I don't feel like um, I don't identify with with the culture in the way yeah. most people do. No, um, I, 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 in in all my travels, and I did a lot of traveling in the earlier, like in the first thirty years of my life. But by the time I was twenty eight, I'd been in thirty five countries on on wow. five different <laughs> continents. And and still, I I remember that Japan and India were the two places where. I kind of stepped into a different reality space that was co-created by the people of that place. Like it, 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 what people call a culture shock, not in a kind of negative way, but, but a complete sort of literally feeling that I wasn't quite touching ground yet, that I wasn't in this space yet for, for a week to 10 days. It, it, it only happened to me in India and in Japan. Uh, J J Japanese culture is fascinating. I, I hope I get a chance to come back sometime. 
I hope to see you here. And on that, we better end up, right? Yes, you have to ex go. <laughs> exactly. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, and great to day. connect. And, great. Day. and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Bye-bye. And, and you have a great day. And thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, making these opportunities, not only with me, but all the other people you've talked with. I've only listened to... Uh, uh, a few and they're just wonderful to hear this kind of blending of ideas and stuff it's fantastic yeah, living the questions together uh, that's right, <laughs> okay. That's right. Right. See ya. okay take care bye. daniel bye